uh, the chapter eight in the book, uh, it's about the installation of heating, cooling, and refrigeration system. You do not need to remember a lot of the details in this chapter. I'll tell you what you need to remember. And uh, to be honest, most of this stuff is not that necessary because when you buy an equipment that will tell you what wire gauge to use and how long. But now you understand why. Because you cannot just put the, the condenser outside at the, at the neighbor's yard and run a wire all the way to your house. So there is limit to the wire. It's not like unlimited power. So we'll talk about that. I'll talk about the American wire gauge system, which you will see in every wire. And what does it mean? Why is it the size it is? And how big does it, does it get? And what other solution you can do to improve your, uh, if you have to put the, the equipment really far away, and you do want to lose a lot of voltage, what you can do to improve that. Uh, advantage and value of copper and aluminum conductors, that's obsolete. Nobody uses aluminum conductors anymore. So, but uh, you will see them. If you go to all the houses now, you will see aluminum. In some of the equipment here, you'll see, you'll see aluminum uh, wires. And you know why? They, at some points, decided to use aluminum. Cheaper? No. It is cheaper. I think it's during World War II, and during the war they were running, they were running out of copper. Hmm. So as a substitute, they used aluminum. So that era had a lot of aluminum instead of copper, but they don't make it anymore. Copper is more recyclable. They found more, they found more and more inexpensive way to recycle copper. So the more, most uh, wires are made out of copper. But you will see in some equipment they have aluminum wires. Uh, however, they are very br uh, brittle, and they do crack easily. So. I don't think they have a lot of advantages, to be honest. But if you see them, please try to replace them. Let's say you go to uh, an installation or a maintenance, you do maintenance on a, on a boiler, and you find the wire actually is coated with fabric, it's very old and crispy. You have the right to say, listen, I'm not going to install anything until you fix these wires. And I've been through a few jobs where the wiring was completely uh, non-functioning. It's very crispy and falling apart, mm -hmm. and some strands are coming out all the way from the control panel to the boiler. So you can say, uh, please call an electrician and have them, have them change the wiring, otherwise I cannot install this boiler. Or you can install the boiler, but you're not going to plug it in until they have sound wire. Why? Because again, you need the sound and the right and correct size wire, otherwise it will overheat over time and will cause you to have a fire. And what if you have a fire that was caused by the boiler? You will lose your license, your company will have to pay for the repair, or maybe for the damage, and it's it's a big deal. Question. What's the difference between regular copper wire and oxygen-free wire? Let me ask you first. I know there's a difference in copper wire, and I never knew that. Uh, that. There are two types of copper wire, from what I know so far for our application, either stranded or solid. Stranded comes with a lot of strands, it's bundled, and solid one piece. That's what I know. And that's what we use for our application. Uh, of course, cables and wires goes from different, uh, different sizes, different shapes, different materials. And again, uh, for us, we use copper, and we have two types: either co either solid or stranded. Uh, what are the factors considered when sizing wiring for uh, an electric uh, electric uh, equipment? Preferably size, complete the voltage drop. So, what we need to know. WG, American wire gauge. What is the code now for HVAC equipment when it comes to gauge? What gauge do we use? Come on. What gauges do we have? What gauge is a thermostat? You'll know by the end of the class. <laughs> so the bigger the gauge, the smaller the wire. So gauge 18 is very thin. So these wires here are, anyway, this is gauge 18. Very thin. Gauge 16 is a little bit thicker. Gauge 14 is much thicker. So, three years ago, for HVAC, it was gauge 16. Now it's gauge 14. So that's the standard. And it comes in two types, either solid stranded when you put them together they have certain 
standard. <coughs> we'll talk about uh, the wire insulation. That's the sheathing. Some of them are moisture resistance. Some of them are uh, thicker than others. Some of them have Teflon. So we'll, we'll talk about that and what application is, uh, is included in type size enclosures. So this is the sheathing. Enclosure. That's the when you put your wires inside. You don't want wires to be dangling outside. It could be either like a conduit or metallic or anything else. So your enclosure is not the insulation? No. The insulation is the sheathing? Yeah. And it's then your enclosure would be like you just... Where you put your bundle, where you run your wires. Yeah, okay. it could be the plastic, it could be, if it's outside, usually it's metallic. Yeah. Or uh, something that will be UV resistance. And uh, the better enclosure you have, the more you'll keep your wires intact. Either, are, are they going to be buried? or exposed, uh, and you'll see a lot of really ugly wiring jobs when you go on the job, and you'll see how annoying that can be to have wires all over the place. And also the color coding, guys, please do yourself a favor and the person after you, use some color codes. Don't use all the same color wires. Mm -hmm. It's really tough and annoying to try to trace where each wire goes. If you all, all the hearts are black, you're gonna go and try to trace it, and suddenly you lose Sight and you pick another wire. It happened to me in the shop many times, but they are the same color. It's really hard to trace the wire. So use colors. I had to use the today with a lot of blue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's amazing how limited our eyes are. So blue, 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 and you suddenly pick the other wire. That's crazy. Yeah. Have you noticed that in your, <laughs> if you go behind your TV, where you have your TV, your Kudu, your whatever, so many wires, 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 and a big power cell, trying to unplug the DVD or the cable? and you unplug something else. It's try and error all the time, because they're all the same color, they're all black. So you're gonna go and trace it. Suddenly you plug something else, and oh, whoops, something else went out. So the color is very important. If you if you just happen to have not uh, all the same colors, put a label on it at least, or stickers or tape or something. We'll talk about breakers, circuit breakers, and uh, switch, disconnect switches. So for this station, we have broad range of subjects. It's uh, there's a lot involved. One of the most important is the electric current servicing, the equipment, and its size. So what is the current going to the equipment and how much voltage do you want to drive to that, that equipment? So panels, they bring power inside the structure. You know the panel? This is your panel here. Are you allowed by law to install Take power from the panel? No. no. No? Only licensed electrician, you call Sean, and he will come and do the wiring for you. He's not here today. So he's, he's licensed. He will come and install the power and take it all the way to the disconnect switch. He will put the disconnect switch for you, and then you can do your wiring. You can wire the entire boiler any way you want. And, uh, well, there's only a few ways you can do it. <laughs> Panels, and uh, there are several kinds of them. This enclosure also. Uh, these are approved by the power company. The enclosures are different depending on where you're gonna put it. Some of them are, if it's outside, it has to be weatherproof and sealed. If it's inside in a factory, they have to be explosion proof in case something explodes in a factory. So make sure you pay attention to the code. What code do we follow? What is the code? NAC. NAC. So the code is going to be in the final. Because you need to know what what is who's responsible for the code. National electric code. The national electric codes are responsible to do those uh, codes for panels, uh, wiring, and the state code has to be either equal or higher than the federal, which is the national. The local code, the city code, has to be higher than the state and higher than the federal. So you can add stuff in, but you cannot make it less. 
National Electric Code, given the wire time and size, and uh, it gives you the particular wires or amperage you require for each circuit. So, for a circuit, amps wire has to be fourteen gauge. Fourteen gauge. So if you go to your house, if the circuit is fifteen amps, if you go to the circuit breaker and it has a breaker that's fifteen amps, probably the wire that has to go through that circuit is fourteen gauge. If it's sixteen gauge, probably it will overheat. If it overheats, it will catch on fire. And the first thing will catch on fire is the sheeting. It's uh, rubber, it's plastic, okay? it's petrochemical. It will heat up enough and it will cause you a fire. 90% of house fires are electrical. So we don't have fireplaces in the house as much. Uh, hardly ever somebody forget their cigarettes on and it, it lights the house on fire. Mostly it's electrical. Something is overloaded, it heated, and if you notice everything is plastic, plastic actually is flammable at certain temperature. If it heats and milk, it will catch on fire. So copper is the most popular conductor. Always stick with copper. It bends easily. It has good mechanical strength. It resists corrosion and can be easily joined together. If you do any wiring in the lab, it's really easy to join copper together. It sticks together because it's soft. You can put a wire nut on it. The code says that you're not supposed to connect stranded and solid together in a wire nut. That is debatable. People do it still. Mm -hmm. But you're not supposed to do, do that. Why? The connection will be different. Why do we use solid and why do we use stranded? They have different applications and you'll see why. When you connect in a board, when you connect using solid instead of, uh, of uh, stranded, you don't get the same connection. So let's look at it from top view. This is my solid wire. I'm trying to press on it with a plate. I have a screw here. I'm trying to get the connection. What is my connection? It's only these two points, right? Mm -hmm. Unless I really press harder and squish it up, which is not going to happen. With stranded, the little wires will spread out. So that's a better connection you have more spread out that connection. If that's uh, necessary. Usually in electronics, they have terminals, so you can connect the wires. However, some uh, if you don't use the right wire type, you'll have some annoyance connecting the, the, the wires. Trying to put like stranded wire into a solid terminal, that's really a yeah. challenge. You have to braid them around and put them in. So it, it can be a little bit challenging. And uh, I find the best way to deal with those terminals and connections is using what? Spade connectors, there's always spade connectors, all sort of connector where you can put uh, into uh, a wire. Spade connector where you can crimp the wire in here and make sure it has good connection. I put it in here, and those come in all shapes and colors. Some of them have a ring. Those are really good to connect, and they're very cheap. Have some with you and save yourself a lot of hassle. Never go to a job without uh, a good functioning crimp tool and uh, yeah. wire stripper. Uh, if the wire has, is losing some strands, just cut it and start new. If the sheathing is worn out, cut it and start new because you want to have the right connection. I never underestimate that if there's not good connection, you might have heat overheating and you might have a spark. So I started an electrical fire today at work. Yeah. Just by changing a, changing a light bulb. Yeah. An old, like a really old sconce with the uh, candle opera bulbs. Yeah. I just put a new light bulb in and turn around. I heard a spark and then it just went into flames. Wow. So I ran to the switch and, and shut it off. What was the problem? I don't know. It was melted by the time I could get to it. <laughs> <laughs> See, how it, it is easy. So I had to I had to change the um, the socket. Yeah. Inside of it, and then I. Had to, I took out the wiring back and put new wire in. Okay. It was a pain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, literally just put a new light bulb in and the, the socket must have had that connection. So, 
if you look at this old socket again, please do not, do not like overlook this old sockets. What happens, they build some kind of junk in them, an oxidation, and it might seem like it's connecting, but it's not. And a small little arc will just build up in there, and build over heat, yeah. and build up heat, and eventually it will catch in fire. And sadly, a lot of roofs are made out of wood. There's wood all around the house, so it's just, uh, the worst part about these sconces, or they're they're so old, they like they have like the wax on the. Um, I'm trying to think. They're like old gold sconces, and you know the rubber or not rubber, the plastic piece that goes over like. Yeah, yeah. Pocket? Well, those have like wax on them for like a. a oh. So that caught on fire too. Doesn't it? Was, doesn't take a lot of heat. Yeah. Doesn't take a lot of heat. Did you see sometimes when you shortcut something when you are connecting, it welds up. In the in the shop here in the panel with somebody like arcs, it welds. This is how much heat you get from 120 volts. It's a, it is serious. So this enough spark can cause a fire. So aluminum was the old, it was used for low low cost. Somebody did say low cost, but it not, does not have the conductivity. So what is the best conductivity material? Copper. Huh? Gold. Second. Silver. Third. Copper. 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 Then aluminum. So uh, aluminum was okay. Second to best and uh, it corrodes easily and it's very fragile. After bending it over and over, it will, it will not is carry. Is brass conductive? Huh? Is brass conductive? Brass is copper mixed with nickel. Okay. So it, it, it is a good conductor, not as good as copper though. Uh, again, where do we use solid and where do we use strand? That's also a good question. Uh, strand and wire are very easy to bend. So if you're going to run wire through a conduit, it's easier to use stranded than solid, so it's going to be easy, really hard and difficult to run through a conduit. So you cannot push it through a conduit. That's another thing. So you might want to mix and match. And if you use a, a stranded over and over, it will use some strands. So stranded is like, it's going to be annoying to, to connect with thermals, but uh, it has its advantages. Do not knock any of these two, you need both. So when you go on the job, have a bundle of solid and bundle of uh, stranded at the right gauge, at the same gauge. Uh, American wire gauge, it defines the standard wires. It lists the largest wire, which is four zeros, down to the small, which is 50 gauge, which is as it's, small it's, as a it's hair. Tiny. Huh? Yeah. Because I work with the gauges and wire in this. And what, what, is, what is the gauge? For this is 24. That's the, way, that's the gauge wire that I use. Yeah. So way. probably uh, 50 is very, very thin. Yeah, it's thin. It's very thin, you cannot even see it. Yeah. You just assume it's there. Yeah. Not this thing. I don't know, probably you can see it, but it's very, very thin. Yeah. The most popular number is 16. The number four, uh, who wants to see, I think you've seen it before. Number zero, zero, zero. I think it's there. There's a lot of cable companies here in, in the New England where they produce wires and cables. Uh, this is uh, four zeros, very thick. Mm. You can run four thousand volts through this. Mm. And look at look at the at the protection, wax layers, another sheathing, and shield of copper. I'm gonna pass this around. Probably see it in the beginning of the semester. But I'll pass it again. So you appreciate how much insulation is in there. Yeah. If you're gonna run <coughs> ten thousand volts or something through this, you want something very safe. So this is a piece of wire. And how do I how do I lay that? You have big bundles, and you dig in the you dig a, a hole in the ground, and you put pipe, and you put this through it. There's also the interoceanic cable, it runs all the way from Maine to Europe. It's a cable. Underwater. 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 Yeah. Fun. It's it's very awesome. Imagine a cable going all the way from Maine all the way to Europe. It was for the internet. And I remember in 2007, we had an outage in the, of uh, internet in North Africa and Eastern Europe because a, sh a shark bit the, the oh. cable. I thought it was a joke, but it was real. <laughs> the shark decided to like go and bite the cable on the water. Shark. And that was the first time I realized actually it's, a, it's an actual wire. I thought it was all like wireless or something. No, there is an actual cable between North America and Europe. <laughs> Some ship went there and laid wire like that all the way in the ocean floor. Yeah, but oh, there's gotta be yeah. like sections yeah. that give more power to it, right? It's communication cable, so it's not a lot. It's not power, so there's a lot of communication. 
Also, did you ever hear about the underwater turbines in Cape Cod? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. they're gonna have some cables coming from under ocean to transmit the power all the way there. And we have a lot of... Uh, it's like that cable? Yeah, something like that, yeah. Probably more flexible. I'll, probably this is something like, something like that, so it will not grow. So again, they will run cable just like that all the way under the water. And those will never deteriorate in the water, right? Because that's not supposed to. Because there's no oxygen in them, right? So no, I don't know if it's completely insulated. Yeah. Underwater also there is low oxygen. Not a, there is oxygen, but not, but not a lot. There is some stuff living there, so I'm sure there is some oxygen. Yeah, but the salt, salt, salt right, that's what I Yeah, I don't salt. think it's gonna, this is completely rubber, so I don't think the salt will get to it. And I don't know who said that, but when things start to grow algae on them, that's the best insulation ever. Somebody was building bridges and he said like we build a bridge and once it has a lot of algae on it, that's the best protection ever. Because it will protect all the, yeah. So they don't even clean it, they leave it there because this is a natural way to conserve that. I don't know man, they have a lot of uh, great whites now in sharks in Cape Cod and bull sharks, so they're on to us. We're gonna get the communication at some point. <laughs> the shark. Shark attack. <laughs> shark native. Huh. That was a double smoothie. Huh? Yeah, that one was. Okay. <laughs> and I can't even really make six of those. Really? Yeah, we made six of them. We did six examples. Intense. <laughs> so, circular mill system sizing, it's another way to size wire. You don't have to worry about it. We're not going to use that. We'll keep things like uh, with American wire gauge. We're not going to be electricians. But it's good to know that there are, there are different systems for sizing a wire based on the uh, diameter. This is from the book. Yeah. The reason I brought this up is just to show you what is the, the trade name. So the trade name is where they are known in the field, and probably in the industry they have different, different names. And this has to do with the installation. And if you look, there's also operating temperature. So there's a maximum minimum for how hot and how cold they get. Do you ever notice also in the summertime that the aerial wires dangle, they fall down, and they have uh, some flexible connection between them to allow them to to expand and also to contract. So there is limit for the heat, 90 to 194, how hot does it get? And again, you will need to run some wires in very hot uh, areas. Paper? Huh? Does it really say paper? Yeah, some of them have paper. It's not like actual paper. It's <laughs> just called paper. It's very okay. cheap, yeah. Okay. Drying the application. Again, as you said, there is some kind of moisture buildup. There's also issues of uh, soap. Um, so yeah, there are some, some options here that you can look at. Yeah. We're not gonna bother with all these details. Factory to consider in wire. So this is the, one of the best thing I want to, I want you to pay attention to is voltage drop. That's something we need to remember. The voltage is 120, for example, and the resistance increases, and you require the same, this stays the same. I'm repeating, if we increase the resistance, what happens to the voltage? It drops. Okay, keep balanced. The equipment's going to ask for whatever amperage it wants. If it wants 14 amps, it will get 14 amps. And if I increase the resistance, I will decrease the voltage. So, if I have an equipment here, let's say a motor, and I have a wire all the way here from the source, this could be to this. Okay, so the distance here. adding resistance. 
make sense? Longer wire, longer resistance. And more heat, right? And more heat. Here's the, the oxymoron thing. What about thicker wire? Is it more or less resistance? Less. It's more. Less. Huh? Less. More. Yeah. So if you have a small wire and a big wire, thickness, which one has more resistance? This is less. This is small. It's like a big five and a small five. More. Even though they are the same resistance. So we have one wire, this is a, it's very long, but the resistance is increasing because it's very, very long wire. So that will cause us to have a voltage drop. So instead of, and what is the voltage drop maximum that we have? We said that last class, 10%. 10%. So if we drop by more than 10%, that's the, that could be the run of flat. And also the, the voltage coming from the power company is not always consistent. 117, 118, 120, it's always inconsistent. So we want to make sure that even with this inconsistency, we can still run the equipment smoothly. Especially with very delicate equipment like mini splits, they require to have a certain kind of voltage. Computers, control rooms, they want a certain amount of voltage. So we have to adhere to the amount of uh, length we have from the disconnect switch all the way to the motor. Uh, and that's the only reason we need to, do, to care about voltage drop. If you can remember that, this is what you need to care from the class. If you have to run, if you look at the installation guide for like any mini split in AC, they will tell you, do not run this for more than 100 yards. They will tell you that. So read those little instructions. If you have, and 100 yard can be like, you might not pay attention to it, but it, it, can, it can, you can exceed that quickly. Going from the basement all the way to the third floor, you, you exceed it. So what do you do? If you do, probably you have to call the company and they will tell you, to use a bigger wire to compensate for the length. So you probably have to go from gauge 14 to gauge 12. So, but again, that will cost you money and you have to change the wire completely. Uh, so this is one thing you have to worry about. Second thing is the insulation type. What is the insulation? Is it going to be water resistance? Is it going to be moisture proof? Is it going to be inside or outside? What is the worst enemy for all petrochemical companies or polymers? Water. Huh? <laughs> that, is, that is true. That is true. Why do they like it? Why do they buy it? It's warm. Huh? So they buy it? I don't buy warm stuff. They try and get rid of your mouse. Huh? It's an your mouse. They don't have your brain. What is the big cap? It's warm, I'm gonna buy it. What is this piece of bread? I don't get it. I don't get it. It's very weird. I hate that. The heat? I don't know. Maybe it's his thing. They think it's animal. I think they're thing. vindictive. I think they're thinking about it. Probably. Yeah, I think they know this has something to do with it and it pisses up and they're laughing in the background about it. I think so. Mm -hmm. Why would they do that? It's not food for them. There's plenty of food. Why don't you go and buy the wire? Hmm. But anyways, uh, I'm a hit dog. It's not mice. So <laughs> it's not mice. It's, it is mice in real life. They do chew on wires and so look for that. If you have mice, this is something you have to suspect. They're biting through wire. But it's uh, UV. Ultraviolet. Ultraviolet is one of the most ferocious enemies for any polymer. Remember the, probably you don't have, know that, but uh, cars in the 80s and 70s, because they did not have a lot of UV protection, after a couple of years buying the car, all the interior will start to get crispy, and you have cracks in your dashboard and the back. They changed all that because, again, they have to do protection for UV. And all this uh, new car smell that we like, it actually it's bad for you, it causes cancer, it's a fact. And now, we don't, if you buy a new car, you don't get the new car smell, you get some rubbery smell. It's good for you, but it's not the same. So this new car smell lasts a year, which basically, you're, it's emitting and reacting with the sun, and you, you are inhaling it all the time. It's bad for you. And it's a reaction between the UV and the polymer, making the something called VOC, volatile organic compounds, which is not bad for you. So UV is the, is the worst enemy. And uh, you're right, maybe it has to do something with the warmth. A lot of uh, a lot of issues you have with disconnect switches is moth building nests in the disconnect switch, or spiders, or insects. And I guess it has to do with the warmth. Maybe they like the vibration of electricity. Maybe they want power too. For like spiders and stuff? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, a, it's like an enclosed area, so they're building their nests in a, like 
if it's a disconnect box, yeah, I mean, they're, they're safe from everything else outside of it. So. Yeah. Uh, you know, Bill used to say, if you want to find where the draft is, look for the cobwebs. <laughs> because that's where spiders go and build their nets to capture all the answers. Of, okay, interesting. So, insulation type enclosures, what kind of enclosures do you need for the wires? You have to keep the wires exposed, again, uh, for mice and for somebody to pull on them. And also look for safety, which means, uh, what do we mean by that? The temperature and what can burn around those wires. Voltage drop. So again, voltage drop in a conductor, prime important when we, when we do wiring sizing. We wish for to make sure we did not drop the voltage by too much. Uh, even small drops, like can you see the 10% can be an issue for things that are running correctly. Uh, and that's something also you have to think about. If something used to run really well, for a year, then the customer said that this thing is kind of humming too much. Something might have, might have happened. The wire might have, might have got older, connection got rustier. So in the beginning it was running okay, then after a while it's just not running anymore. Things oxidized and changed. Uh, and computers, for example, I did research on that. That uh, Remember when you buy a new computer and it runs very quick? After a few years, even if you format the whole thing, it still doesn't run very well. And uh, somebody told me you have to change something in the under the processor called the heat sink, which basically deteriorate with time and heat and start to not connect very well. So I, there's some connection things that happens in the computer in a small level that prevent it from performing the same way. Same thing you have in a connection. Those, uh, those connections after a while, they will rust. They don't connect as well. The connection between the wire and the other one will rust, will have some accumulation on it. So probably you will lose uh, drop of voltage here and there and the 5% became 10% and suddenly the, the equipment is not running correctly. And again, the motor is not going to be running as well as it used to, so probably it's drawing more now. So that's a, that could be another issue. Uh, yeah, so again, there's a maximum for branch by 3% drop of the voltage. If we have a branch from the main line, we want the drop by 3% tops of the actual. And uh, there's an allowable voltage drop from one manufacturer is 10% below the main plate rating. 10% for main equipment and 3% for a branch. What's the branch? If you take uh, something in parallel from the main line, it should not be more than 3% drop. So remember the 10%, don't forget, forget about the branch, but mostly 10% is the maximum, is the minimum drop, maximum drop. ABC wire sizing, usually accurate for sizing conductors unless it's extremely long. 100 yards is the general rule for that. If you suspended the wires way too long, you might wanna go around some calculation and see if that's okay or not. Uh, in most cases, it's within 100 yards. Many items on the NHC cover the size of conductors. There's a lot of information. These things change, change and update all the time. So uh, consult somebody, find, it's good to have a friend that knows the codes, or be signed up in a form and will tell you what has changed. Calculating voltage drop is the same thing. The formula, voltage equal amperage times resistance. In most wires, wiring run uh, to heat and cool the British equipment will not exceed 75 feet to 100 feet. Actually, 100 yards is the general rule now with 14 gauge. But if you have to, you calculate. And uh, if you look, hopefully I have it in the PowerPoint here. If you look in the book, it will tell you what is the voltage drop per 100 yards. Can you repeat the 100 yards? It's like shipper. Yeah, this is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen, uh, I've seen uh, for the new in yards. One day. We'll all speak the same language. Probably not. No, you didn't think so? No. I'm hopeful. You don't know how frustrating that for us. When we went to engineering school, we have to learn everything in both metric and imperial. It's just uh, annoying. What is the resistance here? I found it somewhere in here at some point. You'll find it in chapter 8. 
there's a drop of uh, resistance in each uh, wire. I don't think they have it here. Anyways, it's a good idea. They also have the weight, I don't know why. So the voltage drop will be how much volt will run through that uh, wire. The average required for the equipment times the resistance of the wire, and that will give you the voltage drop, and you subtract that from the voltage incoming. Or you can do it the easy way, which is connect the wire, measure the voltage in the beginning, and measure the voltage at the end. What am I getting? Let's see, what is my voltage drop? Am I getting 10% or not? And again, what happens to the what happens to the wire when it heats up? The resistance increase. So you have to measure the voltage drop at running temperature. So imagine the temperature goes up in the summertime, that will be a completely different story than in the winter. So do you notice that in the summertime you have a lot of internet outages? A lot of it has to do with the heat. So when wires get hot, they will have issues with resistance and the voltage and communication will be completely different. So there is uh, also fluctuation in resistance when it comes to heat. Okay, disconnect switches. Most equipment have, have to have uh, a disconnect switch. We'll have a disconnect switch for the, for the equipment right next to it. And it could be two or three pole switches mounted in the enclosures for each hot lake. Let me show you some. So your disconnect switch is the first line of defense. If something goes over the equipment or you're running on equipment and suddenly it starts start catching fire, something went wrong, you're gonna go and disconnect the switch next to the equipment. And they are usually have a fuse in each pole to break if the equipment goes haywire. So this is one is fused and it's for three phase equipment. The second line of defense is your circuit breaker. If the disconnect switch is not respond, the circuit breaker will trip and it's cut off the power. So, with uh, some of them have uh, fuses, some of them have circuit breakers, so it could be with or without. What is that depends on? The code and what does the equipment ask for. Uh, fuses provide overcurrent protection, same as the circuit breakers. Maybe general duty or heavy duty. Heavy duty disconnect switches are sealed against water, storm, pressure, and uh, they are tamper proof. And some of them are explosion proof if they are to be installed inside the power plant. So again, check uh, the code for these enclosures. So general type enclosures, we're talking about conduits now. This is for the wires, where do we put them? Again, nobody wants to go to a house with wires all over the place or with tacks, that's completely unprofessional. So it's good to keep your wires in a bundle at the right enclosure. Uh, inside a house, I've seen a lot of enclosures made out of plastic, just for aesthetic reasons, and also to prevent them from tampering and from mice to come and chew on them. <laughs> Maybe we should use the, the pipe ones. The other ones are aluminum, and they're complete enclosures, and they can be painted as well. Uh, there's also a rain tight ones. If you're going to put it outside, there are rain tight. <coughs> Usually they are like, uh, they look like pipes, and the connection between them has some gaskets to, to prevent water to come into the wire. The problem with the metallic ones, if there's a short, the whole wire will be, the whole casing will be uh, energized. What, what will help you at that point? That's a sad thing. No, there is something that you actually plan for. And we talked about it in week one. Yes, and what else? That's something always connect to all the casings. Huh? Ground. So all these casings has to be grounded. And if you look at, if you open any receptacle, you see a green wire connected to the receptacle, that's a ground. So all these are grounded in case one of them cut loose and touches the casing it will trip the ground. 
And if you are going to put it outside, probably you will have a GFCI disconnect switch in the panel. So in case something tripped outside, a tree fell on the, on the wiring casing, one of them disconnected or cut, it, uh, it touched the, uh, and it touched the pipe, it will activate the ground. Explosion proof, these of course can be used in any location, but they're expensive. So who's gonna put explosion proof in every uh, disconnect switch? But they are mandatory for plants, especially power plants, because there's a possibility for explosion. Or if you're building a bunker somewhere, or you are preparing for the zombie apocalypse, you can put explosion proof, but you do not need to, and they are again very expensive. Uh, and mainly they are for power plants. Fusible, this is what it looks like. Again, two lines of fuse, no fusible switches. They only break the power, they do not protect against overuse. These are the fusible switches. Do you want to take a break or should we just continue? Good, okay. 